Donald Trump is going on trial for a so-called Stormy Daniels secret agreement that somehow violated campaign finance laws. At least that appears to be the theory advanced by Alvin Bragg, the district attorney in Manhattan against President Trump. Because the Four Boxes Diner covers all Four Boxes Diner, including the jury box, I thought it important to talk a little bit about some of the strategies that President Trump may be engaging in this trial and some of the things the district attorney may be doing to try to make it hard for Donald Trump to be elected president in November, which we really want because we cannot afford four more years of the anti-gun Joe Biden. Let's talk about it when we get back. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Boxes Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the U.S. Supreme Court Bar, and author of many books, including Disarmed, What the Ukraine War Teaches Americans About the Right to Bear Arms. All right, folks, so I just got off Fox News, so I figured we should talk about this issue because it's a hot topic. I'm going to do a lot of media this week about it, and that is this Donald Trump trial in Manhattan, part of New York City, uh, involving whether or not he improperly recorded in his bookkeeping records uh, payments to Stormy Daniels, but characterized them as legal expenses. I still can't figure out why any of this is an issue, but we know why it's an issue, which is that the Democratic Party and the anti-Trumpers in America, the people that hate America, want to do everything in their power to prevent Donald Trump from being elected in November. And this is just one of their many strategies. Now, because I've tried cases uh, all over New York City, including in Manhattan, I want to talk a little bit about the process of jury selection because I think it would be helpful for you just to understand the process of how one picks a jury and also some other sort of inside information perhaps about this Donald Trump case uh, that you may want to keep in mind going forward. The first thing to understand is that this is going to be in Manhattan. Now, New York City has five boroughs. The most sophisticated and the wealthiest of the five boroughs is Manhattan. The other boroughs are the Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. Now, Manhattan is extremely wealthy. It also has very sophisticated business people in it. They have bankers, they have lawyers, uh, Wall Street, real estate brokers, and all sorts of other white collar professionals. This in theory is helpful for, to President Trump because the notion of people entering into contracts with a confidentiality provision or an NDA, which means non-disclosure agreement, is pretty routine. So everyone on that jury is likely going to have some understanding of entering into contracts with these kinds of provisions. So it's not unusual when the jury is being selected from Manhattan. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is the process of jury selection is a misnomer in my opinion. Whenever I pick a jury, I am not interested in it selecting a fair and impartial jury necessarily. What I really want to do is to engage on behalf of my client in the process of jury deselection jury deselection. What I'm trying to do is when I'm asking questions or engaging in a voir dire and the like, picking a jury. I'm really trying to unpick a jury. I, I'm mostly worried about getting individuals on the jury that will be anti my client, or in this case, anti Donald Trump, who also have sort of the ability to persuade others by virtue of sort of a force of their personality. So the last thing you want on a jury is someone that's going to be against your client, but has a forceful personality that is the, the type that can persuade others to go along and vote against your client. In this case, for example, voting against Donald Trump. If you're Donald Trump's lawyers, which I'm not, but if you're Donald Trump's lawyers, you want to make sure there's no diehard anti-Trumper on the jury that's going to try to persuade everyone else to be anti-Trump. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is as far as I'm concerned, the Democratic Party and the Biden supporters have already won the case. And what I mean by that is that every single day President Trump is in the courtroom, whether it be for jury selection or the trial itself, is guess what? Good for the Democrats because it means that it's another day that Donald Trump is not out on the campaign trail. He's not doing media. He's not talking to the people. He's literally just sitting there in Manhattan, a borough and a city that, of course, he's never going to win or anything like that. And of course, we know that statistically speaking, approximately 87% 
of the people that live in Manhattan are registered Democrats, the rest are Republicans. And guess what? Those Republicans in Manhattan might not be the kind of Republicans that are pro-Trump. There's certainly lots of rhinos or Northeastern establishment Republicans uh, along the lines of a Chris Sununu or a Mitt Romney type uh, who may not necessarily be a diehard Make America Great Again kind of conservative or Trump supporter. But with that said, um, it's going to be very problematic, I think, for Donald Trump to get a fair trial on this because I think that, um, you know, you're, you're not really among a jury of peers. You're going to basically, and this is why the Democrats have made it clear, they want to try Donald Trump in Atlanta, a Democratic stronghold, Washington, D.C., the heart of deep state, not a Democrat, a, a total Democratic stronghold, and New York City, specifically Manhattan, another Democratic stronghold. So I don't see how uh, Trump's going to be able to, at the end, they get a fair jury uh, trial here. And moreover, the judge, uh, you know, I'm not going to belabor the point about Judge Juan Marchand here, but certainly there's been no evidence in my view that he's been unduly favorable to Donald Trump. For example, if I were the judge, I would have at least waited until there was a decision by the U.S. Supreme Court on judicial immunity, presidential immunity in this context. Moreover, of course, I would have really pushed hard. This is what's weird, is that the statute of limitations for the misdemeanor crimes associated with improper bookkeeping has already expired. So the only way this case can go forward um, is by virtue of claiming this is somehow a felony. And the only way to convert these improper bookkeeping records, the allegedly improper bookkeeping records, into a felony is by claiming that Donald Trump was trying to hide some other crime. Now, the most logical crime to try to allege that Donald Trump was trying to hide, and this is what the district attorney seems to be going for, is that these payments to Stormy Daniels by Michael Cohen, who at the time was Donald Trump's lawyer, was somehow an illegal campaign contribution to help President Trump win the White House in 2016. Now, of course, the obvious problem with that theory is that the Federal Elections Commission looked at these payments made to Stormy Daniels and viewed this as not a campaign finance violation. And the, fi the Federal Election Commission, of course, are the foremost experts in federal election campaign contributions and those laws. Likewise, we know the prosecutor, Jack Smith, who's been going after Trump in other cases, uh, looked at this. We also know the Biden Department of Justice looked at this. And yet none of those federal agencies responsible for enforcing federal campaign finance laws cared about this. They said, yeah, this can be easily explained away by virtue of the fact that Donald Trump is a business person. He paid off Stormy Daniels uh, by virtue of this alleged settlement. And therefore, no big deal. Business people do this literally every day all across America. They pay off former employees or, or, or spouses or whatever and enter into confidentiality agreements literally every single day in America. Not a big deal. This has nothing to do with campaign finance in any respect. There's a lo logical other explanation for that. Nevertheless, Alvin Bragg, the district attorney, uh, in New York City, specifically Manhattan, obviously didn't sit, doesn't seem to care because again, it draws the attention and spotlight onto Donald Trump, onto Judge Marchand, and onto the District Attorney Alvin Bragg. And whatever happens here, there's no doubt that these people will be blessed and honored and worshipped in a sense and applauded by the mainstream media and the Democratic establishment, which is my guess is all they really care about. They don't care uh, that you like them. They only care that the Democratic base likes them and will down the road give them awards at various law schools and honorary degrees at these liberal universities because of their great public service in going after Donald Trump. Now, now, they will talk about it in the context of a phrase that I made up over the weekend called judicial theater. And by the way, just as a side note, I've been thinking about like the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and the gun cases, how to describe the motion practice, meaning the motions that these judges go through to pretend to respect the Second Amendment. And I really, and of course, they never do. They always rule against the, the Second Amendment in favor of gun control. And I think the phrase that I want to develop, and you can feel free and run with it yourself, is the notion of judicial theater. They're putting it on show trials. They're making it look like they're fair and impartial, but they have a particular agenda. We certainly see this all the time with these blue state courts dealing with gun control cases involving the Second Amendment. They pretend they care about the Second Amendment. They pay lip service to Bruin. They pay lip service to Heller and so on. But in my view, in many instances, we're really just looking at a form of a show trial or judicial theater. Now, as to what happens in front of Judge Marchand here when it comes to this Trump case, let's see how it plays out. But again, if I were the judge, 
I would have delayed, I would have done two things. One is I would have delayed this case pending the outcome of the presidential immunity decision to see if that might influence anything. There's no reason why you can't wait a couple months to see what the U.S. Supreme Court says in June, June about Donald Trump's alleged presidential immunity, see if that plays a role here. The other thing is I would have been extremely aggressive against the district attorney and I would have really said, look, I don't understand how you're going to, sh you know, shoehorn uh, this prosecution basically arguing or bootstrap this uh, this prosecution into some sort of federal felony crime of campaign finance violations where the experts in the area who have who are no friends of Donald Trump passed on the prosecutions why would you be able to do this and I would have aggressively pressured the district attorney to really lay this haul out and I'm thinking I probably would have dismissed the case on the grounds that you simply can't prove your case because every single business person in America enters in these kinds of confidentiality agreements and pays and that's how they record, you know, they record this stuff. And this is a bookkeeping debate. And keep in mind that one wonders how many billionaires know anything about their books and records. It's not like Donald Trump's going to be sitting down and typing in a bookkeeping program or writing checks. The reality is that billionaires like Donald Trump and wealthy individuals have other people do this kind of work. So Donald Trump obviously had bookkeepers and accountants paying these bills and doing these entries, one wonders why Donald Trump or how Donald Trump would even know what was entered into like a bookkeeping, electronic bookkeeping file. It's just strange credulity. Nevertheless, that is where we are. The last point I want to make about this, of course, one of the hardest problems I think the district attorney is going to face in this case against Donald Trump is, again, there's no victims. Usually, if you have a criminal case, you really do want to have a victim sitting in the witness chair to say, this person committed fraud and cost me money or this person hit me over the head and now I'm blind or whatever it is. But you really do want a crime victim testifying or right about why that criminal defendant did something wrong and how they've been hurt. Here again, there's not a single victim that's gonna be sitting in that juror, in, in that witness chair, testifying to the jury. I mean, you may have the likes of Michael Cohen, uh, whose record and uh, credibility is probably largely shot by virtue of his conduct over the last many years uh, and his convictions. And Stormy Daniels, an adult film star, who knows how credible she's going to be. But my understanding is she signed a letter at one point that says she never had an affair with President Trump. Uh, but again, we'll see what the evidence at trial says about all of this. At the end of the day, though, I think this is a big win for the Democratic Party because they are keeping Donald Trump locked down in a courthouse in Manhattan, which prevents him from doing the, the single most important job, which is to be reelected, as I see it, uh, to help fight for various things, including the Second Amendment. And for those of you who doubt his support of the Second Amendment, I have three words for you. Gorsuch, Barrett, and Kavanaugh, and thus uh, nice server versus Bruin. But there's a lot more we can talk about, and we will going forward. Nevertheless, uh, these are some of the details to keep in mind involving this Trump hush money case, uh, which I think is really a sham case and nothing, there's no there there. But, you know, I'm not the judge uh, or the district attorney in this case. So we'll see what happens. And again, don't forget to subscribe here at the Four Boxes Diner. Don't forget to follow me on X at Four Boxes Diner. And we'll see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Order is up. Table 2A.